Hi, good evening, and welcome back to Let's Talk About Mental Health. I'm Nels Foster. I'm an addiction psychiatrist working in southern Vermont. And my name is Robert Stack, and I'm a licensed alcohol and drug counselor and licensed mental health counselor. And uh, we do this show, and it's been going pretty good. Uh, we've been trying to do a topic and, and then do a question and answer the following week based on the topic. And so tonight we were going to start off with alcoholism, but during the week we got a question from a, a, a viewer who was asking a, a follow-up question to an original question. So we're going to take care of that first, uh, because that's really why we're doing this, is trying to be helpful to folks. And then uh, as time permits, we will then begin the discussion with alcoholism, and we'll follow that into next week and, and, and finish up talking about that. So. Okay. Yeah, great. So when I read the question, then we can sort yep. of comment on, on why we felt that this was so important. We wanted to address it tonight rather than putting it off. Uh, so I wrote into one of your earlier shows about my concerns that my current roster of medications was jeopardizing my recovery, in particular my ADHD medication Adderall. Since I first wrote in, I've taken myself off my Adderall for fear that I would get hooked. But my psychiatrist, and also my wife, contest that the negative impact of my ADHD on myself and my loved ones puts my recovery in jeopardy, far more than the possibility of getting hooked on stimulants. Having spent the last 37 years of my life coping with my ADHD without medication, I'd like to think I can keep my relationships and my recovery in control without Adderall, but I do have doubts. So finally, I come to my actual question uh, for you. In your experience treating people who have both ADHD and chemical dependency problems, is a lack of medication really as dangerous as the possibility of becoming dependent on a prescription drug? Okay. All right. Right. Now, I think what, what appealed to, to me about this was there are a lot of, a lot of themes in here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the idea of you know, co-occurring disorders, right, with ADHD and addiction. There's the idea of sort of you know, risk and benefit of medication. How do you define your own recovery? So I was struggling to kind of think of what the theme might be around this. But as I thought about it, it sort of came to me this morning that there's this idea of um, being a savvy consumer, uh, knowing how to sort of use your, your physicians, your therapists as, as consultants, and to take and reflect on their advice and to keep an open dialogue uh, going. And not only, of course, with the people who provide the treatment, but also with family members uh, as, as well. So I think that's, a, that's an overarching theme in this question yeah. that we could I think hopefully address as we kind of pick through the various pieces of the question. And, th and this question comes up for people in recovery all the time. And, you know, I don't have one answer for this. I mean, really, quite frankly, I, it, it's... Um, I mean, I'm really nervous about going against your psychiatrist's uh, suggestion and taking yourself off psychiatric meds without consultation right. and without working with the uh, doctor. Uh, I, I never recommend that to folks. I mean, I, but on the other hand, um, it, for some folks, it's so strange. There are, there are people who are on psychiatric medications that probably don't need to be on them. And that there are people who are suffering through life, and I mean this in recovery, who would greatly benefit from being on medications. Right. And yet they, they have this fear, and it's, it's a healthy fear, and it's a right fear, that this medication is, is, um, is a risk for relapse. It's a risk to become dependent on it. And I, I, I said before the show that, you know, I think, I think the word dependent on a prescription medication one should not automatically assume that that's a negative thing. I mean, you know, so if you're, de I'm dependent on my blood pressure medicine. Right. Uh, you know, diabetics are dependent on their medication. So if it's a medication and it's the right medication and it's helpful to you, then you really need to be careful about not taking it. Right. Um, I used to say to my patients, and I'll, I'll let you say more because I'm just really, I mean, it's not for me to say, but it, you have to be so careful in early recovery. Now, I don't know how early this is recovery for this person, but this whole idea of being self-will. I know what's best for me. I know what I need to do. And boy, it's so hard to argue with people in recovery about medications that way. It's like, I don't want to take them. And I recognize that. I understand that. On the other hand, you really have to sort of back up and say, okay, now, wait a minute. Is this, is this me being stubborn? Is this me not wanting to listen and run my own show uh, and not doing what people are recommending to uh, me? Because we've often met people, right, right where yeah. our ideas might be counter to their ideas in just this sort of circumstance. Yeah. And, 
you know, often take the approach, well, okay, this time we'll do it your way. But if it doesn't work, and I think we've said this before, yeah. let's come back and talk about trying a different way. Because uh, what a lot of people finally kind of give up on is that self-will and say, you know, there's a way that has worked for most people or more people, and maybe I should be open to the idea that that's the path to take. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to begin us to the idea that, you know, rec recovery needs to be, you need to define it yourself. Yeah. And, and it has to be something that works for you. So um, some people define it as complete abstinence, right? I mean, like the old school of, of AA, for example, yeah. was about no medications whatsoever. They didn't even want you taking ibuprofen, certainly not antidepressants. And that sort of must be softened a little bit or evolved a, a, a bit more from that very, uh, you know, straightforward black and white sort of, uh, sort of approach. But, you know, like you said, dependency is not addiction. It's all these behaviors that go around with it. That's right. You know, if you stop taking your blood pressure medication and you're being dependent on then you get what's called a rebound hypertension, which means your blood pressure shoots up because you suddenly stopped it. Uh, you know, opioids, even if you are perfectly following how you are prescribed the opioids, you will still get a physical dependency, whereas if you stop it suddenly, you'll, you'll have withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And uh, antidepressants, you know, we try to call it discontinuation syndrome, but in plain English, it really is a type of withdrawal. Right. If you look, for example, like at Effexor, that's, that's the worst one out of all of them. You stop that suddenly, you're, you're very uncomfortable. Again, so almost like flu-like uh, flu -like symptoms, you know, nightmares. Uh, so symptoms that do come from that. So, of course, a stimulant, you know, like this question is, is talking about primarily. Yes, you could become dependent on that. Right. You could become dependent on that um, physically, or you could get to the point where all of a sudden you're chasing after this, using more, those same sort of behaviors that uh, were part of the opiate dependency as well. So it's a really tough walk, and I think risk versus benefit with any of these things is really the essential question to, right. to ask here. And it, and it comes up too in other uh, psychiatric medications sometimes that where the patient says, I'm not comfortable with this med, I'm not sure I want to be on meds. Mm -hmm. And you have family members or people who live with you say, gee, you're a lot easier to live with when you're on medications. Oh, yeah. And you almost have to balance that out. I mean, you know, uh, sure, it's true, you've lived with your ADHD for all these years without meds and you think you can continue, you're in recovery, you want to be clean and sober, mm -hmm. that's commendable, I support that. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, it, it, boy, I, you know, I, I hate to tell somebody, I, I, I wish I could, and, and I'm second guessing the doctor here, but I would look at some medications other than Adderall, and I'm, I'm wondering if they tried other meds. Uh, that are not the uh, stimulants and as 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 high risk as Adderall. Now, yeah. uh, again, I, I'm not a psychopharmacologist, so that, that's a. Right. But again, I I, I want to just say it, and, and I think the other thing is that um, whenever you're on medication, and we talked about this, uh, you always have to be aware of your. If you if you went into the hospital, you were saying earlier, if you went in the hospital for a, a pain operation, for a knee operation, and they gave him opiates, he'd want to be aware of his addiction. Oh, absolutely. You so know? even if we're going to wish this guy well to have a, a lifetime yeah. of recovery yeah. from his opiate dependency, I guess he's 37 or, or maybe, yeah. you know, in his early 40s at the most, judging by the question. Um, when it comes time for knee replacements, hip replacements, been clean and sober 20 years, 30 years, don't forget to tell your surgeon that you were actively addicted to opiates back in your late 30s. Because that will rise up once you get those prescriptions. That you'll have some memories that'll come back, that feeling will come back. And let the, let the surgeon know, right? I used to be this way and don't write me a, a prescription for three weeks or a month. Don't give me unlimited refills yeah. around this. Yeah. Keep it tightly under control. Make sure everybody knows what's going on. And don't make it a secret because that, again, a way to be uh, an informed or savvy consumer is to, to be honest in that kind of a dialogue with the, with the physicians who are, are not mind readers and are going to take a very standard approach that might put an addict in trouble. And let me just try and answer the question. And as a drug and alcohol <laughs> counselor, as a mental health counselor, I tell my clients that if they have a, a medication uh, for a psychiatric illness, not taking your medication increases your risk for relapse. Um, taking your medication is part of your recovery. Um, now, I mean, whenever you make a blanket statement like that, I, I appreciate there's individuals, and individuals can sort of disagree or, you know, 
but his question was, is my lack of medication as dangerous as the possibility of becoming dependent? Again, I, the quality of life. Um, last week or two weeks ago, I mentioned Dr. Uh, Senior when I met to him about depression in adolescence, right. and he said one of the dangers for children or adolescents with ADHD is the frustration of not getting things done, of not doing anything right, and losing faith in yourself. Yeah. Now, it doesn't sound like this guy is at risk for this, but nonetheless, I mean, I, I wonder, you know, if there is a point, and I don't know this, and I don't know whether alcohol or opiates at some point gave him comfort from the frustration of his ADHD. Mm -hmm. Right, whether that's, there's that connection there. Yeah, yeah. and, and <laughs> if he gets to a point, and it may, that it increases or it gets worse or whatever might happen, uh, that again, that idea of self-medicating with a substance, uh, whether it be alcohol or opiates, uh, for people with dual dis disorders, that, that, that is a really tricky place. Because uh, self-medication is a form of rationalization and justification for taking the drug. Right. And I think that's pretty dangerous for people. Yeah, I mean, and I think key with any, any diagnosis, whether it's ADHD or, or, or depression, as, as two common ones, is the presence of dysfunction. Right? So if you're functioning, well, like for, with depression, for example, um, I feel sad, I'm not sleeping very well, my appetite is down, but I go to work every day. Yeah. Um, I'm still uh, not, I'm lo not losing any, any weight. Uh, I still find some joy in a few things, though maybe not as much as I used to. That's not necessarily a level of depression where you have such dysfunction and you should be on a medication. There can be alternative approaches at that sort of an early stage. So I think, again, looking at, I think as you're saying, that f is that frustration going to come in? It's going to put you at risk for a relapse. I think then we're talking about what is the level of dysfunction that could be associated with this thing called ADHD that a number yep. of people are saying that you have. Yeah. You know, and, and you and I talked about this early, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of abuse of medications for ADHD, uh, especially in schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's, um, people think it's an enhancer for taking tests. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's really a, 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 t a terrible stimulant. So, oh, yeah. anyway, I, I, I just, I mean, it's a great question. I don't have the answer for this individual. I don't know if you want to yeah. uh, tell him. I guess I would go back to your doctor and I would go back and discuss this or bring your wife in and talk about it. Is there a non-chemical way of dealing with ADHD that well, is helpful? Yeah, no, um, there's actually a recent study that, that came out of uh, Europe. Uh, not a few weeks, uh, a month ago, it was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry that... Uh, looked at non-pharmacological or non-medication approaches, and they came out thinking that those approaches were not nearly as successful as the medications uh, can be. Right. Now, who studies these kinds of, of, stu of, of research? Uh, it's certainly pharmaceutical companies and, and universities that get involved with that, so you, you might want to argue there's a bias, but I've also seen time, over time, this has been studied for about 50 years, I believe, the use of stimulants in ADHD, and they do consistently come out as being a superior treatment for, for treating ADHD. Yeah. And, and like you said, I mean, neuro, uh, the term neural enhancers, right? I know if I st need to study, I can study better. If I need to, you know, I got some, some work to do, I can get it done more, more efficiently if I'm, well, on speed. Right. right? That's what people used to call these things. And so there's, it, you can get benefit from it even if you don't have ADHD, but it can seem more critical if you do have ADHD right. to be on a stimulant. And last but not least, and I think sometimes doctors, excuse me, doctors uh, and family members, a lot of times they'll tell you to take a medicine, but an addict or an alcoholic will know, I can't take that med. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and they go, well, no, just take it as ordered. Just take it the way you're supposed to. Uh -huh. And it sounds so kind of ordinary, like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll just take that drug as ordered. But the addict, it took him forever to come to grips with the fact that they are a drug addict and they have no control over their drug use is saying, I can't do that. Right. right. I've done that. I've tried mm -hmm. that. I've tried for you. And, and yeah. I think, and I don't know this, but if, especially if these people didn't know him when he was active. Right. I mean, you know, it's possible that they've only known him in recovery and they just think, oh, he's fine. He's great. He does really well. And, uh, mm -hmm. and he's like saying, no, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I know, I so there, there's a fear there. You, yeah. You've you got you to listen to that voice that's, that's right. making you scared because we know that for people getting into recovery, right. 
the, the, you often see you need to substitute something. So whether it's the substitution is a medication like Suboxone or Methadone, or whether it's uh, getting involved with a, a, a faith community, uh, whether it's attending you know, 12 steps and throwing yourself into AA, there needs to be something that is either less harmful or actually social and helpful that needs to be a substitute for that, that gulf that comes from, from not being, taking the drugs anymore. And so you often find, too, that people then develop dependency or addiction problems with a different substance. Right. I mean, at the methadone clinic, I can't tell you how many times people will um, get into trouble with cocaine, and they're like, Doc, I don't know why I'm doing this. I never liked cocaine before. I, I just, you know, it's always there, and I'm using it. And I think it's part of that substitution. So, again, not knowing very much about the, the, the person who's writing the question, I think he's got to listen to that, that voice. Yeah. Is, you know, maybe I'm going to run into trouble with, with, with this as well. And I, mean, I want to... Yeah. I don't want to let this one last. Right. I'm really enjoying this yeah. question. But, you know, a lot of diagnoses tend to be fads. I don't want to say fads, but they come to more research attention and they get a lot of research dollars mm -hmm. and people develop their reputations on studying these, these illnesses. And, you know, for example, bipolar disorder and ADHD, they've worked themselves into our, our common speech these days. So people talk, I'm bipolar or my ADHD. And I think that, so quite often there's a tendency to jump to these diagnoses because there's so much attention being paid to it. They're almost, uh, we're seeing it all over the place, whether it's really there or not. And, and something that like ADHD really requires a little bit of history gathering. To, to sit in a doctor's office and just two of us talk about yeah. this, you know, there's that, we mean to trust each other. It's part of us being human and, and surviving and having relationships. So if you could tell me that, you know, I've got ADHD and I had these sort of problems and, you know, I'm not paying attention, I'm scattered, I'm all over, I can't concentrate. I'm going to tend to believe what you say. And they prescribe a stimulant. And a lot of kids know this, and they get prescriptions and do really well with it, uh, really well with acquiring the, right. these prescriptions that they don't need. So the really issue needs to be a bit of a history. I'm, I'm often asking patients, can I talk to your mother? I want to talk to your mom. Right. I want to see your school records. Did you have uh, what's known as a 504, an IEP, right. you know, which individual you know, educational programs in, in, in school early on? Few people have had testing, but you know, they have some kind of data that this has happened, gone on for a long time. It, it's always been there, and that it's in more than one setting. So I, I can't concentrate at work. Well, I, gotta, I hate my job. I do fine when I'm at home. You know, I, I can you know, do yard work, carpentry, those sort of things, no problem. But man, when I'm at work, I'm bored. So no, it that's, that's, needs to be in more than one setting. So you, can't, you sh shouldn't be diagnosed with ADHD if you have it in one place. Right. And, uh, Bad concentration can be other things as well. Uh, maybe it's depression. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's bipolar disorder, for example. So making sure you got that uh, sort of thorough investigation of what it might be. And two, I have a patient, and uh, it's his wife that drove him in the treatment. And you know, so talking to her, talking to him, when I meet with him, I say, "How's your wife say you're doing right now?" Yeah, you know, doc, dose is good. I'm doing well. I'm. I've got, I'm, I'm working, I, I've, I've got a permanent job, we're saving up money, in which case I'm like, yeah, you went from dysfunction to function with this medication. You're not running out early, you're not running into trouble, so this is a good match with this guy and his recovery and this medication and this diagnosis of, of, of ADHD. Okay. But it's not, but so I want to assume with our, 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 um, our writer here that this is a valid diagnosis. I'm going to assume that a psychiatrist has... Uh, done his research, I'm going to assume that there's no doubt that he has ADHD. And so I think, again, the question is, how has your functioning been? You know, how are you doing better off of it? What are you losing by not uh, taking the Adderall? Right. And, and that's really, you know, what's it, important here. And it's really, and we're going to end with that, just wanted to say that, it, you know, a lot of times when I've worked with patients who are on other medications and they're addicts, they, they want to justify getting on stimulants and they want right, and they yeah. know what to say. Like you were mm -hmm. saying, they know the right things to say. And I, I remember a lot of people now would say, uh, well, when I do cocaine, I just feel normal. Yeah, I'm wondering, is that true? Uh, no, that's well, right, yeah. it, you know, if they did cocaine, they felt normal. They would chase that dealer down the block. I mean, right. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'd <laughs> be wasting time with me and Adderall. Right, right, yeah. It doesn't work that way. But anyway, so... Um, I hope this is helpful. Uh, we really appreciate you asking this question. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's not an easy thing, but none of these things are easy to answer. I mean, it's, it's, it's life, it's medications, it's yeah. tough. Anyway. I mean, how about one trick to maybe help make this decision? Go ahead. Uh, often talk, uh, 
suggests this thing called the decisional balance. So on the one hand, you want to look at, okay, what are the benefits of being on Adderall? What are the negatives of being on Adderall? Yep. What are the benefits of not being on Adderall? What are the uh, negatives of not being on Adderall? F do like four squares on a piece of paper. Yeah. Fill each of these boxes up. You might be surprised one of these boxes is going to fill up more quickly than the other. Also, sort of attach some weight to each of the things in this box. Um, and then sort of try to do a balance and see if something does sort of come out. This might be a way of really sort of specifying the various pieces that might be floating around subconsciously. Right. You know, my wife says this, uh, marital bliss uh, versus, you know, being employed uh, versus, again, the risk. If that frustration starts to rear up, if, if you're not employed, you know, can't keep a job, if uh, your wife and you are arguing all the time because you forget to do certain things right. you promised, then these are things that need to be in, in one of these boxes. And that might help to kind of make a decision on which way you want to go. And let the world know you're on Adderall. Right. Uh, but again, uh, uh, if you did that weighted thing, and you put down here, what are one of the risk of being on Adderall? Yeah. And then, and the, in the previous uh, message that we got before this one, he disclosed that he was on Suboxone, which right. to us means he was opiate dependent. Right. And so when he writes down one of the risk of being on Adderall, mm -hmm. is I could relapse back into active drug use. Yeah. And that's a huge risk. I mean, you would put that in big black ink. I mean, you yeah. could list all the other ones, you know, the benefits of being on it. But when you look at that other side, I mean, my wipe out. Yeah, you got it. You got to say, like, you know, this is this is risky for me. And so again, I, I think it's that balance between, you know, if you're not on medication, untreated psychiatric uh, illness can sometimes be a trigger for relapse. Right. On the other hand, taking a stimulant, uh, daily stimulant, whatever it might be, when you know that you have a hard time regulating intake, you know that that's a that's a symptom of a, of the. Diagnosis of dependency is loss of control yeah. on taking the drug. And, you know, you just have to sort of balance that out. You yeah. know, you know, and it, sounds like, it sounds like he's having dialogue with his psychiatrist. Yeah. Because yeah. his psychiatrist is uh, maybe not pleased. Yeah. He's having dialogue with his wife because she's aware. And, and to, you know, again, I think it's important to hear what people outside of ourselves think about us and, right. and see us doing. And also, I hope he has a sponsor. I think 12 Steps, having a yeah. sponsor, so someone who is... Uh, very savvy in the recovery community. Yep. Uh, that would be another set of inputs, probably really important for this and, guy to and have. And AA puts out, a, and I think NA does too, but AA puts out a thing about medication saying, we're not doctors. If you're on medications, mm -hmm. take them. Right. I mean, they do. I mean, there's a pamphlet. I mean, it, it's out there. I mean, a lot of people say, well, AA was against that. Well, not really. I mean, you know, the official AA, you know, uh, fellowship, individuals in those rooms, due to their own past experience, say, you know, when I took that drug, I went back to drinking, or when that mm -hmm. happened, well, that, you know, that's yeah, that individual. Person, yeah. And remember that, you know, when AA started in the 30s, there wasn't that many medications. There mm -hmm. weren't many psychiatric medications. I mean, right. the, uh, some people suspect that the co-founder of AA suffered from depression. Mm -hmm. And I think if he was alive today and they're worried about him, I mean, I, I, I don't know this. I'm just saying right, that, guessing. you know. Yeah, so the, this idea that the you know, what they said in the 50s or what they said, you know, even in the 60s. I mean, that's, you don't hear that that much anymore. You know, you don't hear people saying, you know, don't go on your medications. I think it's more the other way. People recognizing that if you're on medication, you're going to meetings, you're working a support group or, you know, it's a good thing. It's not yeah. a negative thing. Right. Re so. Recovery has a much broader definition right. these days. Right. And yeah. I, I, I think in some cases, you know, some people use that as a sort of way of saying why I don't go to... 12-step programs is there against mm -hmm. my medications. Right. Uh, maybe, you know, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but a lot of times people look for excuses why they don't go. Mm -hmm. um, when the real reason they don't want to go is the fact that if they go, they will be abstinent. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that kind of probably leads into us wanting to set up alcohol. There we go. For, that's for, what uh, I was For next week, right? right? That's what you that's were thinking. Right. Because yeah. uh, we promised to say something about alcoholism. We used up a lot of time. And... One of the things I said before the show is that I, I, I really want to say that um, one of the big issues with alcoholism, and anyone who's been around a while, you know, that they made this big deal about alcoholism and denial, you know, and all this oh, yeah. thing. Denial's not just a uh, river, right? Just, you know, if I hear that, I'm going to throw it up. Anyway, so, no, no, I was going to not say that. But the, the problem with that is that uh, most folks, 
have a, their own diagnosis of what an alcoholic is. And what an alcoholic is, usually for them, is somebody who drinks worse than them. Right. right. And, and I say that, with, you know, sort of like as a joke, but it's very true in that a lot of people will set up a definition of what they think an alcoholic is. And you'll see that. I mean, you'll see people, um, I used to interview people in the hospital. Uh, I'd ask them, you know, how long, do you, how long have you known you're an alcoholic? And they go, oh, 10 years, ten years four or five. You know, so it's almost as if I know it. And I just have to manage my intake. Yeah. And, and, you know, people do it different ways. They give up whiskey or they, you know, they mm -hmm. do this, they do that. Um, anyway, so I, I think yeah. that's a huge issue for some folks is the, you know, what is an alcoholic? Right. What right. does that mean? You know, what, how do you define it? And right. it's not as clear cut as say what the opiates are. No, that's I mean, right. so many people who say, you know, when I ask them, well, why are you coming to me now? You know, what, does anything special happen besides being sick and tired of, of being sick and tired? And it's often that noticeable change. Well, I started using heroin. Or, well, I started injecting. Mm -hmm. So these are very clear ideas. That was a goalpost that doesn't move. You know, I was never going to be a heroin junkie. I was never going to be a needle user. And then when they're faced with that, that's, that's one that they can't ignore. Uh, unlike with, well, you know, I, I missed one day of work. Uh, I, you know, I, it's right. not that bad. I don't drink that much. Well, everybody gets a DUI once or twice. You know, those are things you can kind of shift farther away, so you don't have to kind of face the idea that who I think I am and, and what appears to be happening are, are farther apart. I've got to somehow get those things to, to ring true. Right. and it's a socially accepted drug. I mean, you know, it's one of the miracles of Canaan, I mean, at the mm -hmm. wedding. I mean, it, it is a... But, you know, it's a reward. You know, it's Miller's time or whatever. You know what I mean? Right. It's a after work or something, you deserve it, you earn it. It's a drug. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> no, and you're rationalizing and justifying taking that drug. Mm -hmm. And some people have refrigerators full of their drug. I mean, it's sort of, uh, I, you know, there was a guy in the 50s who was very influential, a doctor, and uh, he's famous for this curve that goes down and up and, you know. Uh -huh. and a U-shaped curve. Yeah, uh. but, but the thing that I really like about it was he tried to change the name of alcoholism to sedativism because he wanted sedative. to drive home the point that alcohol is a sedative okay. and that what you're taking is a sedative. Okay. And really, I mean, I, I think it would really be so helpful if people can begin to accept. I'm not, I'm not, gonna, I'm not a prohibitionist, mm -hmm. but... I, to understand you're taking a drug and right. you rationalize and justify taking that drug and at some point you become dependent on that drug and at some point that drug is going to ruin your life. Okay. I mean, you know what I mean? I think that's yeah, what we yeah. need to talk about with alcohol. And that's a bad, and as you're saying, that's a big step for people to that's take right. because nobody wants to think that this thing is all around them and that is, is yep. condoned or encouraged. Now, I can't have a problem with that because, geez, I'm going to, have to stop you this thing that's all around me. Yeah. So I think next week what we're going to do is we're going to do a review of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk a little bit about the treatment Treats, options right. and some ideas about recovery. And uh, so again, if you have any questions or any ideas about alcoholism, please contact us. Thank okay. you very much. Great. Good night. Good night.